Hello, um, my name is Evan Schwartz. I'm from California. I work for a state agency called the California Coastal Commission, and we're in charge of protecting the California coast. It's 1,100 miles of, of beautiful shoreline, and uh, our job is to make sure that it stays beautiful and stays unpolluted. Uh, and that's what I work on is the pollution side of things. I try to stop plastic pollution from hitting our beaches, entering the ocean, and educating folks about being part of our efforts to, uh, to clean up our earth. Um, so I'm, I've got a presentation here to go through what we know about plastic pollution, where it's coming from, uh, what its impacts are, and what we're trying to do about it. Um, I know a lot of you are probably far more advanced than this presentation uh, will, would lead you to believe, so I apologize if this may seem basic at certain points, but if there's more information that you'd like or um, if you have questions, please just put your hand up and we can um, try to address things as we go along. Um, yes, come in. Hello. Hello. So as, as many of you know, and I apologize also right off the bat, I've just arrived in um, Warsaw yesterday, and it's 4 o'clock in the morning for me right now, so I'm still trying to wake up. Um, so as most of you know, plastic pollution has become an, in, an issue of increasing importance uh, for the environmental world and for the world in general uh, in recent years. Uh, I'm going to go through some of how we got to where we are today, which is thankfully in a place where we're making a lot of progress on addressing plastic pollution and increasing awareness about it as well. But to really figure out where all this started, we have to go back to the beginning. Oops, that's not forward. Is it that? There we go. I got it. Um, Oh, it's okay. I think the button. I think the button works. Yeah. Um, so if we go back to the beginning, we have to start with this. This is uh, this is the very first mobile phone, um, except it was only as mobile as the cord would reach. Um, many of you probably uh, might have seen phones like this before. This is an antique phone, which means it dates back all of less than a hundred years ago, and it's made out of something called bakelite. Bakelite was the original plastic. It was, first came along as the first moldable material, uh, and it was used to make phones and uh, other materials. It came out in the 1920s and 1930s and started to make plastic more popular because plastic all of a sudden was this magical material that could be molded into all sorts of different shapes much more easily and with far less energy than metals or glass. Um, and as plastics developed into different shapes and sizes, uh, it really became this sort of miracle creation where you could put different things in it to make it flexible, you could put things in it to make it stiffer or uh, you could, it could be breathable, it could be impermeable, it could be waterproof or you could let water through. It just became this real miracle material. And because of that, manufacturers and producers of goods all over the world started to turn t towards plastic and away from other materials uh, as their packaging product of choice. To the point where uh, we moved now to Okay, here, maybe I'll, if we yeah. move it over here, just because some of it is, yeah. I have to move through. Um, now we end up in grocery stores that look like this, where plastic has truly taken over our lives. And in a lot of ways, this is really great because plastic is lightweight, it's less uh, carbon intensive to transport around the world, <laughs> it's completely revolutionized the medical industry uh, to the point where we're much safer and much cleaner than we ever used to be. But it has also led to an enormous number of unintended consequences. And we, didn't, we knew somewhat about the unintended consequences into the 70s and 80s as pollution and litter started to become 
much more top of mind for most, of, uh, for most people, but it wasn't really until the, um, the later years, in the 90s and 2000s, that we started to realize just how dire the situation was. Plastic was such a revolution, in the U.S. at least, that in the 1950s, Life magazine ran this feature where they lauded the rise of the throwaway living uh, uh, lifestyle where people were freed from the idea of having to do dishes anymore because they could just throw everything away and it was, they'd never have to buy a dishwasher anymore. This was just a wonderful revolution that was thought to free people up into a life of convenience. But as we now know, that life of convenience has a lot of consequences. And the consequences really can be found in areas like this. Um, has, has anybody or everybody heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Anyone? Nods of heads, which is great. So this is the Great, the great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, it is part of the North Pacific Gyre. The Gyre is um, a naturally occurring ocean feature. The winds and the currents uh, cause the ocean to circulate, much like a toilet bowl, and all of the garbage that happens to be in the, in the gyre will congregate in an area known as the garbage patch. So most of the year there are two different garbage patches, one west and east, and then at certain times of the year they converge into the area just above the Hawaiian archipelago here. Um, the patch changes in size during the year. It really depends on what the winds are doing at that point before you know exactly how large it is. There are some estimates out there that it's twice the size of Texas. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that there is an awful lot of trash in this section of the ocean. And in fact, it's not alone. There are five gyres in the world's oceans, um, five major, major gyres, and each of them has been studied and each has been found to have accumulations of trash. Um, there really is no ocean in the world that is free from the influence of plastic pollution. And just a little more information about the gyres because the gyres are really something that, um, <laughs> the gyres are what sparked uh, a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, once we discovered the garbage patches, uh, all of a sudden the idea of talking about plastic pollution became very sexy. And so we've, a lot of work has developed out of the, uh, the interest in the gyres themselves. And what we've found is that, as you would imagine, as you would find in a toilet bowl, the density of plastic particles increases the closer you get to the center of these gyres. Um, and the density of the plastic is increasing. Uh, in the North Pacific gyre, plastic particles increased over 1,000% from 1972 till, uh, till just recently. And then in the North Atlantic, where we actually have the longest record of sampling uh, of any of the gyres, the density of plastic is staggering. 130,000 plastic pieces per kilometer squared uh, equals an enormous amount of plastic. Um, it's really important to note that when you're out in the gyres, you would not see this plastic. There are some large pieces of plastic that are out there. There are discrete items that you would able to be able to see, but this is not an island uh, of any sort. You couldn't walk on this. It's mostly microplastic. It's mostly plastics that are five millimeters or smaller. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of the plastic that's out there is five millimeters or smaller. Um, so there are reports in the media or uh, stories that, that get out there that talk about an island of trash. There's no island of trash. It's more like a minestrone soup of trash, um, but it's a really dense soup. So um, all this led all of us uh, that work on this to start to develop ideas about what it is that we're really dealing with. Um, we talk about plastic pollution uh, in the U.S. Uh, the federal government came up with a definition that uh, calls it marine debris. 
uh, and I'm sure there were working groups and years of study that went into this definition, but this is the, def the official definition of marine debris. Um, it does not call out plastic specifically, um, but I'll show you in just a second why we talk about plastic pollution rather than just marine debris. Um, so it is solid material that's manufactured or processed and directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally disposed of or abandoned into the marine environment or the Great Lakes. Um, it is everywhere. It's found around every major water body. It's not just in the gyres. It's along every waterway. It's around every lake. It can be found in the remotest parts of the world where people that don't even live. It is a persistent problem that exists everywhere on the planet. Um, and it's a serious problem both for human health, for economies around the world, and for wildlife and aquatic habitats. Um, we've learned a lot about marine debris and where it's coming from, which is really important. We've been collecting data on plastic pollution and marine debris since the mid to late 1980s. And we've been doing that through cleanups and through uh, our volunteers out there writing down every single item that they pick up. And what we learned is that the sources of marine debris are very different than, they, than what we originally thought they were. There is certainly some that is left by beachgoers. Um, and trash has a way of escaping wherever it might go, even if you are as responsible as you possibly can be about disposing of your trash properly, the system has leakage and there are ways that trash escapes into the environment um, even from the best of intentions. So, for example, you can try to put your trash in a garbage can at the beach, but trash cans overflow, birds get into it, they pull stuff out, trash finds a way to get into the environment. And there is certainly an amount that is lost at sea. Um, cargo ships lose containers fairly regularly. Fishing boats lose their gear um, almost never intentionally. Um, but these are actually very small sources of trash in our environment. The biggest source of plastic pollution reaching the ocean comes through our storm drains and our stormwater systems and our creeks and rivers, all of which eventually flow to the ocean. Um, water is very effective at transporting trash and what we now know is that the vast majority of trash actually starts on land. It can start at the beach but usually it starts much further inland and can travel hundreds of miles before it reaches the ocean. 20% of the trash on our beaches does come from the ocean and 20% sounds like a fairly small amount. I don't want to diminish the importance of dealing with this stuff. Trash that starts in the ocean can be incredibly harmful to marine wildlife. Fishing nets that are lost from boats don't stop working. They're really, really good at their job. Even if they're not attached to a boat, they continue to plow through the ocean, killing creatures right and left until they do eventually wash up on shore where they, became, where they become just more beach debris that we have to remove. So this is bad stuff, and it's not to say that we shouldn't be addressing this um, as much as we can, but it's a very, very small portion compared to the 80% of trash that comes from land. Um, some does come just as plain litter, and in different parts of countries, different parts of the world, litter is a bigger issue than in others. Uh, a big portion comes from industrial discharge, and I'll show you a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, and then there's more from garbage management or mismanagement, containers and trucks that are overflowing. Um, but as I mentioned, there's just lots of points of leakage along the system where even if we're doing the best that we can um, with waste management, um, trash escapes and finds its way into places like the Los Angeles River. Um, this is a trash boom that strung across the Los Angeles River to try to catch all of this, but even this, you can see, is leaking out into the LA River. 
I'm from San Francisco. We're from Northern California. We tend to show a lot of pictures of how trashed LA is because it's sort of, you know, north-south rivalry. So, but I will show at least one from Northern California for, um, you know, equal representation. This is in San Jose. This is a creek called Coyote Creek. There's, San Jose is the second largest city in California. And what we see is that the larger the city, the worse the creeks are. Because the larger the city, the more concrete there is, the more runoff there is, the more likely it is for trash to find its way into the stormwater systems or into the creeks, um, as opposed to rural areas where there's more, there's more greenery, there's more uh, foliage to actually trap, trap trash. Um, but that's it. I'll get back to trashing LA now. Um, so more about the Los Angeles River. This is the LA River just on a normal day. This isn't a storm event. This isn't a flood. This is just what the LA River looks like every single day. An enormous amount of trash and plastic pollution lining its banks. Um, the LA River is part of a watershed that drains all 90 cities within the LA, within LA County. Uh, Biona Creek is another one of those tributaries. Um, all of this trash drains down through the small little town of Long Beach and then enters the ocean. There are measures along the way, like those trash booms I showed you, to try to stop this trash, but a lot still escapes out through Long Beach. So just in this picture alone, you can start to see the items that we're dealing with. There's plastic bottles, there's styrofoam food packaging, there's cups and plates and uh, lids and an unusual number of soccer balls. Um, but these are all these little packaging moments that we confront in our daily lives and this is, you know, sort of the price of the convenience of all of these single-use plastic items. Um, so I mentioned industrial discharge. This is one of the storm drains I've been talking about and down here is what looks like a whole lot of dirt. It's not actually dirt. Those are pre-production plastic pellets. We also call them nurdles. This is the raw material of all plastics that we use in our daily lives. They're trucked to Los Angeles from usually the, the Gulf of Mexico, where they're produced in oil refineries. And these nurdles, and sometimes powders, but most often nurdles, then get melted down to make all the different plastics of our lives, the films, the bottles, the caps, all of that. And all of those items came from one of the 7,000 plastics manufacturers in the LA basin. And these nurdles are lost fairly indiscriminately from these factories because they're very cheap and they, it doesn't, they don't worry about losing a few hundred thousand of them because you know, there's billions more that they're using. And those nurdles travel directly into the LA River. These actually are the most prevalent item of trash on the beaches of LA and Southern California and Orange County, um, which is just south of Los Angeles County. Um, our volunteers never find them because they get out on the sand and they, they look like sand. They're very small, they're hard to pick up. Um, but in the more rigorous scientific su studies that have been done of Southern California beaches, these outnumber cigarette butts by a factor of 100. So um, it is a, a significant, significant problem. And this is a little picture of what the beach looks like in Long Beach, where all of these rivers drain through. Um, it's just a, a sand sample that we picked up after a rain event where you can see there are some nurdles here and there, but most of it is just small plastic particles. Plastic, once it gets out into the, into the water and is affected by sun and wave motions, uh, tends to become brittle and breaks apart relatively quickly. And so what we get are ever smaller pieces of plastic. It will never go away. It's never going to biodegrade. Plastic is way too long of a molecule for anything in nature to truly make it biodegrade. But it does get smaller and smaller, which actually makes it easier and easier to enter the food web. So it becomes more and more problematic the smaller it gets. All right, so that's basically where it's been coming from. And this is 
what it's made up of. This is probably much too small for you guys to see. Um, these are the top 10 items that we've picked up over you know, the 35 years of California Coastal Cleanup Day that happens every September. Um, right at the top, you can see cigarette butts are the biggest thing out there. For our volunteers, that's pretty much the smallest item that they'll be able to find and pick up easily. And clearly, we have a serious issue with cigarette butts being thrown on our environment. Um, cigarettes are made of plastic. They're made of cellulose acetate. It's the same plastic that makes your sunglasses. Um, so these also will never biodegrade, but, it, but they're also filled with toxins and lead and arsenic um, that come from smoking the cigarette. So these are nice little toxic bombs that end up in our environment. And then you, followed by food wrappers and caps and lids and bags I'll talk about. Um, but these top 10 items, which make up 82% of all the trash that we pick up, seven out of the top 10 are single-use disposable plastic items. So when I said we talk about plastic pollution and not marine debris, this is why. Our issue isn't marine debris. Our issue is plastic, and specifically, it's single-use disposable plastic. Every one of these items is either unnecessary or easily replaceable with a more permanent solution. Um, so what we've tried to do is take this data and not just convince people to make a change in their own personal lives, but actually pass laws, pass regulations, get items banned, so that we're not dealing with these same debris items that we have been for 30 years. Um, this data is incredibly stable. The data that you see here is from 2017, so sorry that's not updated. But these top 10 items were the same top 10 items that we found in 1988 when we first have data. They don't change at all, except for a few exceptions, which I will tell you about shortly. Um, so of the plastic items, you guys probably know this already, but um, not all plastic is buoyant. About half of all plastic is denser than seawater, so a lot of it sinks. Uh, a lot of it will start as surface plastic, but then become fouled with dirt or uh, algae and actually sink into the water column. Um, there's actually a fairly small percentage of all the debris that gets into the ocean that's actually on the surface. Um, we get uh, about 8.4 million metric tons of plastic into the world's oceans every year, and only 1 to 3 percent of that can be found on the ocean surface. So plastic is present throughout the water column, on the ocean floor, it's even in ocean sediment, um, and unfortunately it's found a lot in our animals. And all this plastic has an enormous amount of impacts on our ocean and on our economy. Um, plastic gets out there and can foul prop propellers, it can become a transportation hazard, um, it can uh, mess up shipping lanes, and it has economic impacts purely from aesthetics. Um, most people don't like to visit dirty beaches. These people are the exception. Um, there, it's, it, it does take a lot of money away from coastal economies. Orange County in California alone loses $34 million every single year because people want to go to cleaner beaches. And so they go and visit other places, and these coastal economies are suffering significantly. California pays more than $500 million each year to deal with trash along its waterways and on the, and on the coast. So there's huge economic impacts, um, even beyond what, um, what I'm talking about now. So th the one good study we have on this is out of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, which is uh, an area that covers the Asia-Pacific Islands and Australia, uh, um, Oceania, as they call it. And they recorded all of these different areas of loss for them, from tourism to the fishing industry to shipping industry, and realized that plastic pollution and marine debris was costing over $1.2 billion per year for this, for this area. So this region has a $200 billion marine-dependent economy. 
California alone has a $46 billion de marine dependent economy. So the, our estimates for what it's costing us to deal with plastic pollution are way low uh, and probably need to be revisited. So economic impacts aside, there are human health impacts. And this is an area of increasing study. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to get into a little bit of it. But you know, the, the, at the very basic level, broken glass, nails on a beach, um, make it unsafe for people to be on that beach and be the way you want to be, which is barefoot and running around having a good time. It seems like a, a basic right that you should have to go to the beach and not be scared about puncturing your foot. But unfortunately, that's just not the case in most areas anymore. Um, and there are pretty dramatic human health impacts that we're learning a lot more about right now. Um, plastics are made with toxins, and those toxins leach from the plastic once the pH level of the plastic changes. So once it enters the ocean environment with a different pH than what it's accustomed to, the toxins that are used to give that plastic whatever properties it has, whether it's flexible or rigid, leach into the ocean water. And at the same time, the plastic absorbs other toxins that are in ocean water, like PCBs and uh, DDE, the breakdown product of DDT, and they become these little plastic toxin pills, which are selectively ingested by marine wildlife. Uh, they can be ingested at the bottom of the food chain and work their way up. And what we've found now is that those toxins bioaccumulate in the tissues of these animals, uh, becoming more and more potent until they end up on our dinner plates, um, where research is now starting to show some really difficult impacts from the toxins that we're ingesting through our inadvertent eating of plastic. Uh, and we're eating a lot more of it than we think. If you, if you eat shellfish, for example, you could be eating as many as 11,000 plastic particles each year just from that one source. But plastic particles and fibers get small enough that they actually can become airborne. We actually are breathing plastic most of the time that we're just wandering around. Um, so there are lots of fairly scary impacts from, to human health, that we're, and we're learning more and more as more and more research is being done. But then there are the impacts that I think everybody already knows about and um, that I think has driven a lot of the work on plastic pollution around the world, and that's the impact to marine wildlife. Um, birds, uh, sea turtles, marine mammals, all are dramatically impacted by marine debris. Uh, in fact, more than 800 species have been impacted by plastic pollution and marine debris, uh, either through entanglement, as you saw there, or ingestion. Um, you know, this poor sea turtle mistook uh, a plastic bag for a jellyfish, which it tends to resemble once it gets out into the open ocean, and it's jellyfish are a sea turtle's favorite food. Um, this is these impacts are much more widespread than we may think. More than 100,000 marine mammals are killed every single year just in the North Pacific off California from impacts from plastic pollution. And more than a million seabirds around the world each year are killed because of plastic pollution. Um, so just a few more stats for you. 36% of the green sea turtles stranded on the shores of Australia die from, die from marine debris. 36% of green sea turtles, is, it, this is a, a number into the hundreds. It's a large number for a seriously endangered animal. Um, Puget Sound is in Washington State to the north of California, um, where over 200,000 marine animals, were, uh, representing over 200 species, were killed just from fishing nets that were pulled from Puget Sound. And then this one, which is actually, I, I guess, fairly close by, the average fulmar, this is a they're very cute little bird, the average fulmar in the North Sea flies around with the equivalent of what would be for us a full lunchbox of plastic in its stomach. So these impacts are widespread, they're worldwide, and they're affecting a huge number of animals. Um, and some are completely impacted. The Laysan albatross of Midway Atoll, out past Hawaii, 
um, is 100% impacted by plastic pollution. Um, these are foraging birds. They, they find food on the surface of the ocean, and they come back and they feed it to their young. And they're picking up a whole lot of plastic and then feeding it into their chicks. Um, there isn't a single bird, and there's a lot of the birds there, that, uh, that does not have plastic in its belly. And it's the entire food chain that's impacted, too. It's not just you know, the charismatic megafauna, like the blue whale here, but it's also all the way down to the base of the food chain, the salps and the um, microorganisms that, uh, as I said, make up the base of the food chain and actually can cause even more damage since plastic starting lower down has more of a chance to bioaccumulate as it moves up the food chain. And it's not just animals either. It can be entire ecosystems. I pointed out Hawaii uh, before. This is Hawaii, it's real paradise. Um, <laughs> there are parts of the year when the, the Hawaiian archipelago sticks directly out into the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And the northern parts of the western islands of the Hawaiian archipelago just become a mess. And you s this is a normal scene for these islands where they just will accumulate loads and loads of trash that comes from all around the Pacific Rim uh, and pollutes these incredibly beautiful and largely uninhabited islands. So we started to do something about it. And in California, what we started to do was we started to do beach cleanups. Uh, in 1985, we did our first California Coastal Cleanup Day. Uh, it was a pretty popular event. We had 2,500 people at that first event in, along the 15 coastal counties in California. And there was a lot of enthusiasm behind it. There was a lot of desire to do more. So we started year-round beach cleanup programs, and we started doing Coastal Cleanup Day every single year to the point where Coastal Cleanup Day is now the state's largest volunteer event. We had over 71,000 people attend last year, and they picked up over 850,000 pounds of trash. Um, we've had over 1.5 million volunteers participating in the event. Uh, we've cleaned up more than 25 million pounds of trash, and that's all trash that never had a chance, or most of it, never had a chance to enter the ocean and cause all that harm because most of our cleanups now actually happen inland. They happen off the coast along inland creeks and watersheds so that we can stop trash where it starts before it has a chance to actually enter the ocean and cause real harm. And because we've had so many people participate, we have created a constituency that doesn't want to keep cleaning up. They don't want to have to go out to the beach and see trash all the time because now they can't unsee it. And so we've started to do other things beyond cleanup. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just skipping through this because that was for a different presentation. I had to travel light. Um, so what we've started to do, uh, really in the last decade to decade and a half, is we've started to try to take actions to address the worst offenders in our waste stream. We know what's out there. We've got all the data. The data hasn't changed. We know what's polluting our waterways. And we know that we can do things to try to reduce those worst actors uh, so that we don't have to keep cleaning them up. So starting in 2007, we started having local plastic bag bans. Um, San Francisco was the first, very proud. And uh, we banned single-use disposable plastic bags. Other cities followed suit until in 2016 we had a statewide ban that, that passed. We were the first state in the U.S. to actually ban single-use plastic bags. Uh, and in addition to banning them, we put a fee on paper bags as well to try to really push people towards reusable bags. Um, Smoke-free beach initiatives is something that started in 2005 and actually originated with the public health community to try to reduce the amount of secondhand smoke people were having to breathe. But the environmental community got behind it pretty strongly because these bans have been incredibly effective at keeping cigarette butts off of our beaches. Um, and really with very little enforcement, they're just 
people see the sign and they tend to obey it when they, when they see it. We've been moving into bans on expanded polystyrene, which is more commonly known as styrofoam. Uh, foodware made from styrofoam is incredibly problematic once it gets out into the environment. It, you've, I'm sure you've seen this. It breaks apart so easily. Uh, it flies through the wind. It's, it's almost impossible to manage. So there's easy alternatives, and we're just banning it. Um, and then the regulations here um, are a little wonky, but as I've been saying, most of the trash is entering the ocean coming out of our stormwater system. And so our, we have a state agency uh, that we've been working with for years to write new regulations for our stormwater system that dictate within the next 10 to 14 years there will be zero trash allowed to come out of these stormwater systems. So any receiving water body, which can be the ocean or lake or a large river, has to be trash free once the stormwater system empties out into it. And that's going to be an enormous game changer for California because it's going to force cities to take all sorts of measures to reduce the amount of trash that's entering the stormwater system in the first place. So we're going to see a lot more bands of products that can be easily replaced. We're going to see fees on different items to help pay for uh, things like stormwater filtration systems and separators that can go into the system and remove trash while still allowing water to flow. Um, so that is going to be a huge, huge, really uh, ground shift for California over the next decade. Um, oh, and um, I don't know why that's in there. Sorry. Oh, because I went backwards. Sorry. Oh, and so here's what we've been able to see. Um, as I mentioned, our data is very stable. All the items are the same. The only difference is that plastic bags have dropped out of that top 10. And the reason they dropped out of the top 10 is because we've been banning them. And you can see here, this graph actually should start back in 2010 when plastic bags made up almost 9% of what we were picking up on Coastal Cleanup Day. But even here, you can see the steady drop in the number of bags that we're picking up as a percentage of the total waste stream that we remove on this one day um, to the point where it's only 1.2 percent of what we're picking up now. It's completely dropped out of the top 10 uh, and is a diminishing part of our waste stream thanks to the ban. Uh, and we were able to show this to legislators before the statewide ban passed just from the impact from local municipal bans and it was able to provide the assurance that these bans really do work and that we do need to take different actions like this if we're going to try to reduce the amount of trash that's entering our oceans. Um, because the reality is plastic isn't going away. Uh, the plastics industry, in fact, is planning for to double production over the next decade, which means that in another decade, plastics and plastics production will account for 20% of all global fossil fuel use. Um, and we're not going to divert our way out of it. <coughs> Recycling is already dropping. Only 9% of all plastic is recycled around the world, and that number is dropping dramatically now that China has closed its border to accepting foreign recycling products. Um, and some is incinerated, which has its own issues in a lot of different areas, especially in areas where incineration is very diffuse and not well regulated. Um, we're simply not going to divert or incinerate our way out of this problem. We have to figure out a way to reduce what we're creating in the first place. <coughs> so what California's done is that we developed a new set of policies and guidance for all of our work through the next five to 10 years where uh, we emphasize reducing plastics at their source. Uh, this is a new plan that was just ratified last April. Um, we did a lot of work on this to try to make sure that when we talk about trash and when we talk about plastics, that we don't lay all of the burden on us as consumers and taxpayers. The fact is we might be drinking water out of a plastic bottle, but we didn't create that plastic bottle. But for some reason, the entire responsibility for dealing with it is on us after we 
use it. None of it is on the manufacturer of these bottles. This isn't true in a lot of places in Europe, by the way, but it is in the United States. And we've decided that needs to change. So over the next five to 10 years, plastic producers are gonna be coming to the table to start to take responsibility for the entire life cycle of their product so that they can help bear some of the cost and some of the need for innovation around reducing the amount of plastic that we're creating in the first place. Because every piece of plastic that's created is a piece of marine debris or plastic pollution that's just waiting to happen. Um, and if we don't do that, if we don't all take responsibility for this and share in the burden of dealing with plastic pollution, then we're doomed to scenes like this, beaches just entirely polluted, three yards deep, by the way, sorry, three meters <coughs> deep uh, at this particular beach with styrofoam and plastic, as opposed to scenes that we really want to be looking at, uh, where we have safe and healthy shorelines for all of us. So that's my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or repeat anything if I went too fast, so sorry about that. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Come on, you're students, you're supposed to be full of questions. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's great to be I here. Ah, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'm a lecturer, and I want to ask: uh, uh, Are uh, these data available or uh, from the um, website from California Coastal Commission? Can then, I use it in my lectures? You you may. They're not up on the website, but I can copy them to this computer okay, afterwards, you and you can you share it. Yeah, you're more than welcome to it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yep. Actually, I was, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, if you are surprised about something. I was really surprised about those uh, cigarette filters. Thirty-six percent of the uh, of the question. I mean, that's, uh, that seem so, low or high? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm surprised. This is so high, so absolutely. Yep. And, uh, and and also because probably most of us don't realize that uh, we hold that uh, it's made of plastic as well. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the filters. Did you know that, guys? That, uh, that I mean, most of us figure out that it's paper. That's why people. I mean, uh, th 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 that's why I would like to ask you: Do you have uh, in your uh, in your uh, strategy any any uh, idea about the um, uh, uh, more um, uh, information system, how to inform people about this kind of plastic? Yeah. So one of the th we talked a lot about cigarette butts in in developing this strategy because it is, it as I said, it's not the worst item out there. It's plastic pellets and plastic uh, particles, but it's the most uh, noticeable thing that our volunteers pick up. And by the way, the numbers that you see there are incredibly small compared to what we actually pick up during any of our cleanups. We have people filling out data cards, and this is volunteer run thing. It's citizen science. A lot of times you get a four-year-old writing bajillions on the cigarette line or people get sick of counting them. Uh, so it, it's probably 10% of what we actually pick up on the day of the cleanup. Um, the reality is cigarette filters do nothing to protect your health. They are a marketing ploy that has been developed by cigarette manufacturers to encourage you to smoke more. Um, and actually, they've been found to, I do a lot of work with the public health community on this, um, they've been found to cause worse forms of cancer because you have to suck harder to get in the same amount of smoke, which puts the smoke deeper in your lungs and you get a much more damaging form of lung cancer thanks to cigarette filters. So they're not a public health benefit, but cigarette manufacturers have touted them as such. And so what we're planning on doing through the, the new strategy is a, a truth campaign mm -hmm. to try to let people know that filters are not of any health benefit to you. Uh, and then what I'm doing on the side is working with different cities to try to ban the sale of filtered cigarettes. Um, so we're not banning cigarettes. If you still want to smoke, you can smoke. You just can't have a filter on your, on your cigarette. Um, since they're not a public health uh, benefit, all they are is an environmental nuisance. Um, 
and they're incredibly toxic. I mean, it, if you take one cigarette that has been smoked, uh, take the filter off and drop it in a tank full of fish, a, sm a relatively small fish tank, in 24 hours, half of the fish are going to be dead because it is so toxic and so filled with all these poisons. Um, so just imagine what happens when a kid's out on the beach and accidentally eats one or your dog does or something. So, um, so yeah, we are doing a lot of work on it. It's primarily around education campaigns right now, but on the side, we're going to try and take some actions. Um, I would like also you to, uh, I would like also to point one thing. I'm not sure how it is in your country because I see that people are from different parts of the world here. And uh, uh, there, uh, I hear that some of our students from uh, our students are, are going to come here. And uh, uh, what was also very interesting, I think, uh, it's, it is an uh, American way to solve this kind of problem. I mean, that you involve the producer actually to ask them, I mean, to, 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 to come to the table. Mm -hmm. I think in, in Europe, uh, uh, most of us, we used to have uh, a completely different uh, option. I mean, we, we used to have the situation that the government somehow fixed everything. And uh, you know what we mean, huh? that, uh, that uh, we are not expect that uh, producer of uh, cigarettes, for example, will be a part of, of those group who are going, who are going to solve the, the, the problem. So I, I would like you to to, to point it, uh, and uh, uh, I think it's really a huge, uh, uh, um, I mean, something which we can learn uh, and take from your 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 uh, lecture and uh, try to involve it here. Okay. So that's why I had these pictures in there is is to talk about what role companies can play. Um, not all companies want to do the right thing. In fact. Very few companies want to do the right thing because they have shareholders and they, they're beholden to their shareholders. There are ways that we can change that and the biggest way you can change that is by voting with your wallet. The other way is to use what influence you have to make companies change their behaviors. Um, Crystal Geyser Water Company is based in California but they're actually a subsidiary of a French company named Roxanne and they bottle their water in plastic as all other water companies do uh, and they came and wanted to be part of my event and we told them they couldn't be unless they changed their packaging to make it better and I gave him a list of things to do and within a year he had done all of these things that I asked him to do including using less plastic in his bottles making sure his bottlers were cleaning their facilities and not losing pellets to the environment and the biggest thing I asked him was to change his bottle cap because the bottle caps are a huge discrete piece of trash that we pick up by the hundreds of thousands every single year. Um, and there's no reason, especially for a water bottle, for the cap to come off. It doesn't need to. There's no pressure on it from carbonation or anything like that. It's an easy fix if you just put your mind to it. And the great thing was the owner of the company had never thought of these things. He didn't know these were a problem. Once he was educated about it, he started to make all these changes, including developing the first water bottle cap in the world that does not come off the bottle, cannot come off the bottle, it's seriously on there, doesn't have any removable plastic pieces, uh, and is entirely recyclable at every recycling facility in California. He's doing the right thing, and he's saving a lot of money by doing this, actually, because it's a cheaper plastic and, it's, and it uses a lot less plastic, so he's, it's a, a better business decision also. So companies do have a significant role to play through innovation and through educating their consumers and, and frankly, by being responsible for taking their products back at the end of life. Some yeah. Uh, I have a question about the uh, plastic particles that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, do you talk with this those company who produces plastic to reduce the waste how they get out from them? I, I mean, are they willing to cooperate anyhow? Yeah. Um, they're not willing to, but now they're being forced to, mm -hmm. because we have new regulations that have been put into place where companies that are caught discharging those plastic pellets can be fined up to $15,000 per day 
um, that they're that they're emitting these pellets. So uh, we we the we got that law passed back in 2008, and now it's just a question of having our regulators get out there to do the inspections that they need to. But in response to the law that we passed, the plastics industry. Um, which in the U.S. is represented by a group called the American Chemistry Council, uh, developed a whole set of guidelines and best management practices for the plastics industry, which basically amount to buying a vacuum and using it around the, around the rail cars because these things, they, you know, they, they have to attach a hose to the rail car and then they spray the pellets into their facility and it's where the attachment is that they lose most of their pellets. So if they just get a vacuum and vacuum it up after the fact, it's, you know, problem solved. Um, so now these best management practices um, are in place and they're voluntary, but if companies don't follow them, then we can find them. And does it uh, affect it in a significant reduce of those particles? Uh, I'll tell you next year after the <laughs> latest study. I'm sorry, there hasn't been a study done since 2007 on that. Um, but there is one underway right now that we'll hopefully be able to get some positive results from. I was wondering why the number of recycled plastic is so small and increasing. Um, is it because we as consumers are too lazy to make sure it gets done or is it like the, the, China, the China ban and stuff like that affecting it? Or? The, uh, so the China ban just happened recently, um, so it hasn't affected the number yet. It's going to within the next year. Um, there are lots of reasons why things don't get recycled the way they should. The first is that there just isn't enough recycling capacity in the world to deal with the amount of plastic that we've created. And you know, as that curve of plastic production goes up, uh, you know, recycling capacity just has no way to, to, to stay steady with it. Another big part of it is that only two forms of plastic are widely available for recycling, um, or at least easily recycled enough that it makes financial sense. And it's just numbers one and two plastics out of the seven different plastic types that are out there. Uh, and then the other big reason is because of fracking and increased natural gas production, making virgin plastic is a lot cheaper than using recycled plastic. So unless there are areas, like in California, we're, pa we're about to pass a law where we mandate uh, the amount of recycled content that new product has to have, um, without that, in place, there isn't a lot of demand for recycled plastic because it's much more expensive than other stuff. And then the China ban, if folks aren't aware of that, there's China passed a what's called their national sword policy, where China used to be basically where the world sent its recycling uh, up until last year when they refused to accept uh, recycled material or material to be recycled from foreign countries unless they meet the strictest of cleanliness guidelines, um, which are almost impossible for anyone to meet. Um, and so then all of a sudden, you know, the world's repository for recycling plastic went away. Um, so a lot of countries are responding by trying to increase their own recycling capacity. The EU passed some really fantastic uh, guidelines for getting rid of single-use disposable plastics altogether. Um, other states in the U.S. are following suit. Um, but unfortunately, now what's happening is that a lot of the recycling that should have been going to China, which is actually a very reputable recycler of plastics, is now going to countries like Vietnam, where it's going to unlicensed yards, where it's being incinerated or just dumped in a landfill or dumped in communities where they don't have the financial wherewithal to fight it. Um, so it's sort of a tough situation right now where we, we just we need a lot more recycling capacity and a lot less single-use plastic created. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you said about this uh, idea of, of extending the producer responsibility of the, their products. 
does it cover only the single-use plastics or things like fishing nets, for example, as well? It covers more than just single-use plastics. Um, that's the focus of what we're trying to do in California right now. Um, fishing gear is um, it's a stubborn issue um, for a lot of different reasons, primarily because fishermen in general don't want to lose their gear. That's a, a, an expensive <coughs> loss for them. If it does happen, it tends to be accidental, um, and it's hard to hold them responsible for that act if that's what's going on. There are different uh, there are different ways that people have been trying to confront that, either through um, deposit programs for like crab pots that you would pay at the beginning of a season and get back at the end of the season um, when you return your pots. Um, trying to identify whose gear is whose, um, or trying to change laws. There are laws on the books uh, in California, and this is actually true in a lot of areas, where it's illegal for you as a fisher person to pick up someone else's gear if it's been lost out at sea. Uh, it's considered theft as opposed to just cleaning up trash. Um, which seems like a, an easy fix that we should be able to do because there's a lot of people on boats that want to do the right thing. But, um, again, slightly different um, management techniques. And do fishermen have to report that they accidentally lost their net? They're supposed to. <laughs> 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 um, you know, they don't want to be held responsible either for an accident like that. We do have a... Uh, and a lot of places around the world have uh, a reporting line where you can report where it was lost and what it is so that there can be attempts for recovery. But mostly those are designed to assist with transportation and to keep boats from getting tangled in it. Okay, Anything else? Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you so much. <laughs>